external relations conflict war and peace war is a form of conflict resolution that has been used by humans throughout history not so much prehistory foragers we have no no sign that foragers went around exterminating each other whatsoever the motivation for it wasn't there the resources were high the populations were low but as we domesticate plants and animals as we begin to grow populations we get that population density stress if thousands of years ago we didn't know how to deal with it hundreds of years ago we didn't know how to deal with it and so we organize in a primate default of a dominance hierarchy and that does bring order but it is a brutal order that today we can reformat we can reconfigure in which people are taken care of with the type of technology and farming we have we can easily feed the world the kind of technology we have with renewable sustainable energy we can energize the world but these things would free us all up automation and robotics taking away all those labor jobs and freeing us up to do what to do whatever we want especially if we have education education academically as well as trade schools but instead we spend over 700 billion dollars a year slaughtering families around the world for market expansion market hegemony two main types of warfare external warfare which I just talked about but internal warfare or class warfare the warfare of exploitation of oppression of creating lower classes and races that can be disposed of because they're not really human that is internal warfare that is class warfare class race warfare summary leadership in bands and tribes is informal and is based on personal qualities of leadership and again these are small societies in chiefdoms getting much larger authority is vested in the office of the chief now we have a dominance hierarchy authority is the exercise of legitimate power power often legislated by the powerful inequities in access to wealth power and prestige result from rank and stratified societies this is not an act of nature this is how humans organize and we can create any kind of a world we can imagine and organize around to create. The End of Poverty. This is a clip from a film called The End of Poverty, question mark. And it talks about neoliberalism and how underdeveloped is a verb. How the market underdeveloped some areas for access to cheap resources and cheap labor and develops at least some classes to be able to consume at a very high rate then we are surrounded 24 hours a day with who will be if we don't buy this and who we won't be if we don't have this anyway let's watch the end of poverty by the beginning of the 20th century the entire third world had been split up among the powers of the north the two world wars forced the north to create new tools to stabilize the now global economy. The IMF and the World Bank were created with such an agenda, but rapidly they turned their focus toward the third world, where new leaders trying to bring economic independence to their countries had emerged. The reaction was swift and used all the tools available to bring these countries back to their previous role, like the loans of the World Bank and the structural adjustment programs of the IMF. These would later lead to the crisis in Latin America, Asia, and Russia, and plunge millions below the poverty line. This new U.S.-born economic model became known as neoliberalism, and the set of policies used to enforce it became the Washington Consensus, which forced all economies to let the market govern everything. Neoliberalism managed to bankrupt many of the economies of the South, which allowed international capital to take over. This was achieved by imposing a new form of structural violence that was used for decades to maintain these countries 
in a state of underdevelopment. Such violence was implemented by the dictators of the South and their repressive apparatus, which finally brought social unrest that was unkind to the free market economies. The special agents and economic hitmen were born and became the new, less visible means to maintain such control over the globe's resources. If we don't like what a democratically elected leader of another country is doing, for example, opposing uh, the exploitation of oil in his country, someone who looks like me will walk into that president's office. I had the job at one time. Walks into the office and says, and now I just want to remind you that I can make you and your family very, very rich if you play my game, our game. Or I can see to it that you're thrown out of office or assassinated if you decide to fulfill your campaign promises. And usually it's said a little more subtly than that because there may be a tape recorder listening. But they get the message because every one of those presidents knows what happened to Arbenz of Guatemala and Allende of Chile and Roldos of Ecuador and Lumumba of the Congo and, and Torrijos and on and on. The list is, is very long of presidents that we have had thrown out or assassinated. There's no question about that. And they all know this. So we perpetuate the system that way. Here you offer from this, hand, from this pocket, you offer a few hundred million dollars, corruption. Or from this pocket, you offer subversives, jackals, to go in and overthrow the government or assassinate the president. The Washington Consensus was a, a set of policies that was a consensus between 15th Street in Washington and 19th. 15th Street is where U.S. Treasury is. 18th is where the World Bank, 19th is where the IMF. It was not a consensus among the developing countries. It was a consensus among a relatively small group of people who had a particular mindset, and a particular mindset during the period, you have to remember, that Reagan was president of the United States, Thatcher was the uh, leader in the UK, a very conservative mindset that didn't reflect good economic policy, economic theory, as I would understand good economic theory. It, it had a particular political view of economic. Well, the, the sort of world order that, that the, the West and basically the United States and, and to some extent Western Europe have tried to maintain, it's very post-colonial in the sense that we don't try to uh, directly politically control these countries, but we want to integrate them into an international economic order and, and to some extent political order. And, and so even the very definitions of development, the very definitions of, of uh, you know, local industry and so forth, that's all geared in, in a very natural way to the needs of the North and, and, and extracting resources, extracting cheap labor, not creating genuine foreign competition. So, so if you're going to have cars produced in Africa, we'll come do it for you there and we'll, we'll use your workers and, and, and so forth. And, and so in that sense, it, it's... Uh, very much a, a subtle form of, of, a, of an empire, but, but not, not an old-style empire. It's, it's a very subtle form, and that's, you know, anybody with a broad historical perspective is not surprised. When the countries of the South won their independence, the accumulated debts of the colonial powers used to open new markets were transferred to the newly formed governments in total violation of international laws. The only solution offered by the North was more debt with extremely high interest in order to repay the initial one. These newly formed states immediately lost their sovereignty and became even more dependent upon the northern countries, which could then dictate policies on agriculture, trade, and customs and give special privileges to foreign corporations such as monopolies over mineral extraction or monoculture exploitation. In the North, poverty exists largely because the resource, resources are owned by a small elite of individuals and corporations. In the South, the same is true. The resource division is equally skewed towards a small elite. But the South also faces the continuing problem of unbalanced trade and the problem of debt. Poverty exists in every country in the world. There is no denying that. 
but the poverty is much more extreme in the countries that are dealing with this triple problem of of trade debt and monopoly power over resources what i find very disturbing in all this is that there is an implicit assumption although it's not um, always mentioned that the kind of development that is taking place is going to lead to the sacrifice of some people so there there is a a very dangerous kind of an assumption um, and we see it actually happening on the ground that that many people will have to suffer, uh, many people will have to be forced into homelessness, landlessness, uh, some will have to die uh, because we are following a particular economic model. And, and we will get to those people when we will get to them. So I think the, the old concepts of trickle-down theory, the old concepts of uh, growth for the sake of growth uh, are all very much alive. And, and this is very disturbing because we have evidence from around the world, uh, whether you look at Latin America or Africa or Asia, that these policies have not worked. How is it possible to explain the paradox of poverty? How is it that in countries in which there is growing wealth, there are actually more poor people than there were before? In short, how is it that we can explain why trickle-down economics does not work? Why doesn't wealth trickle down from the rich to the poor? There are a fixed amount of natural resources in the world, and those who own the resources, land, air, water, and so on, are able to charge higher and higher prices for them as an economy develops. In order to understand that, I think it would be useful to consider a fictitious example but what would happen if we lived in a society in which there was only one oasis that had all the water, which everyone had to come for their water supply? If a single person owned that water supply, that oasis, we would all be forced to pay as much money as we were able to for that water. Now, further imagine that if you lived in that society and you were having to pay huge amounts for some resource that could in fact be owned by all because it came from nature and there's no particular reason for one person to own it. After a while, or perhaps even in short order, you would begin to feel intense resentment and you would begin discussing among your fellows, what should we do about this? And you can imagine that there would in fact be an eruption of violence as people began to, to try to, to overthrow the, the, the people who owned that, that resource and take it. You take away their resources so you can have it, so what do they get left? And as, as time goes on and that resource no longer is so valuable, gold, no, nobody really cares that much about gold these days, which is what the conquistadores were after. But today, those same countries, a lot of them have oil. And so we, we took away all their gold, we destroyed their cultures, and now we're saying, and now oil's the big one, and we're going to take that too, or gas, or whatever, or water, whatever. And yeah, you, you perpetuate this terrible system of poverty and the system of desperation and anger. Terrorism is directly linked to our policies with resources. In a number of these countries, the governments are authoritarian, are dictators, and they're supported by the West because we think that this is the way to protect our access to the resources. And for the population, they've associated dictator and the West. It's very interesting that if you look at the societies with the least equal distribution of income, they tend to be the most violent. There's a very small correlation between absolute poverty and crime. There's a strong correlation between unequal income distribution and crime. So you look at the poorest societies, they're not at all the ones that are the most violent. It's the ones that have the biggest discrepancy in incomes that are the most violent.